Welcome to episode number 58 of the Speaking Podcast. And today my guest is from Alberta in Canada. Please welcome Rusty LeHay. Did I say the name correctly? Yes. Perfect. Good enough. Good enough. It's a name. <laughs> Good morning, Roy. I know it's your afternoon. Thank you for having me on your Speaking Podcast. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you on. I've been looking forward to this one. <laughs> That's great. I've learned much of what I would say is my speaking approach from Eric Edmeads. He is an excellent trainer and you can find him all over the internet offering free YouTubes, quite a bit of information on speaking on YouTube. So a lot of what I share today is going to actually be coming from him and then with a little of my own flavor and stuff. So one of the things I learned from him that I think is fantastic is having a story journal. And so uh, and also being a woman, I'm quite proud of this one, saying one woman can make a difference, together we can change the world. But here's the thing, is what I've been teaching my writing students for years, is when you have a journal, which they never come with page numbers, I actually number them so that I can keep track and so that I have a table of contents. And in the back, I put places to speak so that we can track that because you know it's a mistake to use the brain as a storage device okay. do you find that yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes and so i have put the back places to speak so that whenever i think of idea then i can put it in there and then you know write it down and then i don't have to keep it in the brain anymore and in the back i have by the page numbers a little snippet titles of what the titles of speeches or stories might be because we learn that I'm sure that you've seen some people who speak who are like reading and you can see that they're reading or they might get lost all of a sudden and, and their speech is maybe too rote, too scripted. And yeah. so they've been trying to memorize their speech. But if you get to a part where you forget the next line, you've almost forgotten the whole thing. Exactly. Yes. And so the idea is just to have that little title, never write down your whole speech. And then you will teach yourself to remember little stories. Because if you can tell a three minute story, Eric Edmeen says you can tell any length of speech on stage. You plump your stories together, remember this story and this story. Then the next thing that a speaker really wants to remember is to be authentic, to feel what you're feeling and to have a story that has some intensity with it and and to be able to show the audience that you have felt what you're talking about because this earns you the right to share a solution to a problem that they might too also be feeling or experiencing or have gone through and not know how to get themselves out of. So can you think of any examples in your life that might fit that? Well, I just know that from the, the speaking that I when I hit the emotions, you're making a trigger. Like people have wrote me. I done one recently. I was talking about my uh, my grandmother at the funeral. That I was too embarrassed to speak for the uh, eulogy. And when I was taking talking about the story, there was loads of people writing to me saying, "Yeah, it made me think about my grandfather." And you know, there, like there was even times because I got through a few different stages in the toast. Was, there was people even saying, "I'm glad the cameras were turned off because it made me cry." You know, so it's amazing what you can actually do with. Uh, with your speech yeah exactly and you know when you were saying that your story made them think of their grandmother here's a silly little thing that I've used in my writing class sometimes to get people thinking of what stories is you ask people what was their first car and did they name it and you would be amazed at some of the stories that come out like and and how some can make you laugh and some can make you cry I mean I have two stories about two first cars one of them will make you absolutely laugh, I'm sure, and one might make you cry. Because a tea leaf reader once told me, get rid of that car. Do not drive that red car. She was a tea leaf reader that read tea leaves in a restaurant in Edmonton that was almost 100 years old. I ended up doing a story on it later for a magazine that when it passed the century mark that it was a restaurant that was 100 years old. And they had at the end no longer tea leaf readers but crystal ball readers. But back to the tea leaf reader. That story, I could just tell you really quickly that there was an accident with it but that doesn't give the depth and the breadth to the story. In that story, after we went to the tea leaf reader, we said, what does the tea leaf reader know? We drove that red car 
from Edmonton, Alberta to the mountains, the Rocky Mountains, where my son's father grew up. We had his daughter and his son with us from their first, his first marriage. And they were fighting in the car on the way back. We had an excellent weekend, lots of partying, lots of drinking for him. I've never been drunk personally. My niece says I have no vices, so I'm boring. And I had not much experience driving. So when he was too drunk to drive back, I crawled behind the seat, slid down into the driver's seat while he held his foot on the gas pedal and the steering wheel, pulling himself off to sliding himself off to the side. I slid down in behind this and I couldn't drive a standard. So this is why we didn't stop to get me going again. We were on the highway and I did well for the first while, but there was a slight rain that day and the, the traffic was packed. It was a holiday weekend coming back from the mountains. It was just jam packed on the highway, a yellow truck. I will never forget that canary yellow of that truck that pulled out and cut me off. And I, with not very much driving experience, must have hit the brakes a little too hard. I started skidding and I creamed across the meridian into the one-way traffic coming the other way. We were T-boned. That Oldsmobile came right inside our car. I will never forget that blue and steel grill right inside our car. All weekend, that weekend, his daughter was talking about how she didn't want to be buried. She wanted to be cremated. She didn't want to be in a box under the ground. We talked to her like she was a mini adult and said, everyone has a right to choose that. But that's a long time away. That's a long, long time away, Darby. How did she know? Because as that car came into our car to stop the kids from fighting earlier, I had said one can go on the floor and one can go in the seat. The one on the floor can have all the pillows. Win, win. It was not a win. We never saw Darby again. Corby had his legs banged up, one leg turned around backwards, in traction in the hospital for months. His son had a banged up knee and a broken ankle because he was squished in the back, but I walked away. I walked away. So that's one car story. Mm. Now the other one, let's, let's end with a lighter one, right? Let's give your readers a little bit of a lighter one, okay? So my very first car that was all mine, not anyone else's, was a blue Dodge Polara, and that had a 418 under the hood. It was as big as a boat. Well, it ate that much gas, too. But, oh, I remember driving that car back from a bridal shower for my sister-in-law. My brother was leaving town at the same time with his wife. I had our mother in my car. We left town the same time, an hour and a half drive back to Edmonton. I made it 20 minutes faster than my brother. Now, I was pregnant, and I was rounder than I was tall, and I couldn't reach the gas pedal. So my son's father had to put a block of wood about that high on the gas pedal. Well, my brother phoned my son's father and told him, you got to put the block of wood under the gas pedal, buddy, because she beat me by 20 minutes into the city. So that's my other car story. So you can get stories from anywhere. The first story is a forgiveness story. How did I forgive myself for that accident? And the second story is just pure fun. But can you imagine if you need to get people talking? Just a simple story about what was your first car and what did you name it if you named it at all? And that gets people thinking and talking. So never underestimate what stories you have that you can put in your story journal. And then when you get asked to speak about something, you can also then say, and so this is something else that Eric taught, but then I also teach my writers to do a little bit more with the table of contents, but he teaches to do your stories, a few lines about what it is and how you're going to connect and whether it's an origin story or uh, uh, the, the story of the right to, to change or what caused you to change or make a leap in your, in your evolution of the way that you're thinking. So you write down little clues for that because that might be you're asked to speak at a conference about change. You're asked to speak at a conference on medicine and you're not a doctor, but all of a sudden you need somebody to spot. Well, you can speak about personal things and how you recovered from them in a different way, but some of your stories in your story journal will be able to have a hook that you can tell a personal story and make it fit for almost anything, almost anything. 
And I, I see you've got the physical book for the story journal. Do you actually use an electronic? Do you put it on a phone or a computer as well? There, I'm, I'm starting to do that. And that's another thing is that what uh, Eric was teaching us also is that in your physical story journal, to do a little circle at the bottom of the page. And when you've got it in your electronic version, then fill in the circle. So you know, oh, that one's in the electronic version. And then every now and then when you're on a plane or you're waiting somewhere, you can enter one of your stories in the electronic version and be caught up that way. That's but cool. always, always have a pen and paper with you. Oh, perfect. And what I actually didn't do at the start, and I'm going to do it now because I, I don't introduce the person. You might tell us, who's Rusty? Now, just because <laughs> I, I know you're doing the books and stuff, but the audience don't. So you might actually tell us. Okay, great. <laughs> My name is Rusty Lee Hay, as, as Roy introduced me earlier. I've been a professional writer since 2003 and a member of an association of professional writers, but writing all of my life and writing professionally since 1999. I've been teaching creative writing for McEwen University and senior centers across Edmonton uh, since about 2008. I started in 2008. Yep, 2008. So I have a love of words. If you want to talk about words or writing or food, I can talk all day long. And those topics, they definitely jazz me up. Definitely jazz me up. So the thing about speaking and words, how the two go together in writing, I mean, how the writing and the speaking goes together, is that having a book is like having a business card on steroids. Who throws a book away? Very few people will throw a book away. Even younger people these days I'm talking to, they don't necessarily want the electronic version. They want the real version. They want the hard copy version there where they can hold it and feel it. And, and the smell of a new book. Oh, heaven. Absolutely heaven. So what can a want-to-be speaker, person who wants to get on stage, who has a message to share, who wants to have that one-to-many effect and make changes with with more than one person at a time. Like, let's say a coach. A coach would be great on stage to be able to serve so many more at one because isn't that the idea that we all want to leave everybody we touch with an amazing sense of increase with something that, that lifts them up and how amazing that is to do with more than one at a time? So having a book is amazing and it makes you look more credible right away. So how does a person who has never written get started writing a book? And that's where I'm super passionate about helping authors get there. I have a stay treat coming up this next weekend, not the coming one, but May 13th. May 14th is a Thursday night. We're going to do a meet and greet, have people talk about what their writing goals are, whether they want to just even get ahead on all of their Instagram posts and Twitter and uh, LinkedIn essays or articles, they can just get ahead on that or blogging and have all their ideas. And I can help them throughout that weekend, create a whole journal of ideas that they can then get ahead of. And so they can take a two week holiday from all of their social media and just have it programmed or just go the next morning, and go this one here, this file today, done. Right. So have it all done ahead of time. The other thing is that for people who want to have that book, Oh, that is so fun working with them because there are several ways to approach writing a book. If you don't know what you want to write about, but there's a topic that really interests you and you're not the expert, you could go out, interview 10 experts and write down their chapters of what you learned from each of those experts. And then in the 11th chapter, you become your own expert from everything you've learned and write your own chapter. Another thing you can do is definitely write your own origin story of I started here and I ended up here, this is how I got here. And then you have your book. So then you take and do something like what I have here is you create, go get a poster board from a, a dollar store or whatever, and then use some post-it notes and write down your various chapter ideas or your topics or your subtopics. So let's get a little bit more precise for some people out there who really wanna get their teeth into writing a book right now. Let's say that you have this idea that you wanna write about. You take that idea and you go, how do you break it down? So this idea, then do 10 subtopics, 
And in each of those subtopics, do then three more subtopics so that each chapter, the 10 chapters, will have three subtopics that you write about. This way, the book practically writes itself. And if you want, Roy, to your listeners, anyone who asks, I am happy to give a handout that I prepared on this very topic of how to do that. So that's one way to do it. The other way is seeds, is you tell a story, you give an example, you share your experience, you give some data, and then you summarize. And you do that with each one of your ideas. So I have this handout that I'm happy to share with people who want to get started writing a book, and they can take that and run with that. So those are two ways to start and get your own book written, or three ways, because the poster board, do that, then the 10 experts, and then your origin story of where you started here, and you're here, and you tell the story of how you got here. Very good. I think, I think I've done it kind of backwards. Uh, what I've done is, when I was at the first uh, A-Fest, it was, uh, the theme was, what's your quest? And I was kind of thinking, okay, what do I want to do? And I said, okay, I want to make change. There's plenty of things that I know about, that aren't good in the world that I'd like to actually change and, you know, give solutions. But I knew that you'd have to be a good public speaker. So I, I joined the Toastmasters and just practiced the, the speaking. And, and, and I've re I haven't launched it yet. I, I printed it and given it to people, but I'm ready to actually uh, launch it uh, now. There's nothing backwards about it. Everybody, you know, there's several different ways to get up the mountain. You can take the front side, the back side, the side side. <laughs> There's several different ways to get up a mountain. And, you know, look at Eric Edmeads, who I mentioned earlier, is that he doesn't have a book yet. He's soon coming out with a book, but he's one of the speakers out there that has done it amazingly well without a book. It can be done. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that a book might make it easier, might make it more of a natural progression to get yourself where you want to be. Exactly, exactly. And uh, like, uh, people... uh, Sorry. Uh, no, like because uh, you actually mentioned the the physical copy, and I totally agree with you because you know sometimes you you can buy the ebook or even send it electronically, but people don't you know they're grateful, but it's not the same as actually having you know the the book in your hand. No, it isn't. And you know what else is that if you have an ebook, uh, people might buy it. They might buy it on the intention of reading, but if they're anything like a majority of people out there who multitask and use their computer to remind themselves of all the things they need to do that ebook will get lost or it'll get shut down when their computer is going too slowly because they have to do this task and they have to do this task and the ebook is an option. The other thing is that when the computer is closed, the book is forgotten about, but a book beside the bed or a book on the, the bathroom counter. I mean, do you know that people can read the equivalent to a PhD? If they just read every time they go to the bathroom. So a book in the bathroom, a book on the bedside, a book on the couch, those will not be forgotten. They're right there in front of people when they're dusting and when they're picking up or when they're putting things away. They're right there. Yeah. But the ebook will often get forgotten. Exactly. Like I love reading and I have the Kindle as well, but no, I prefer to have the book, sit down and relax. Like I can read this year now will be probably 20 or 30 because I'm doing a lot of different things, but I can read up to 100 books a year. Like I just love reading and you know, you can yeah. get to know a person through their words. Mm hmm Right. And you can learn, like, what it took other people years to learn. You can learn it in the time it takes to read a book. Now, for what about the people who say they have no time to read? That I can really argue that one also. I mean, there's two different ways to approach it. You can do speed reading. Or I have found that I could read really good books. I read nonfiction books in the morning, and I read fiction books at night when I'm going to bed, because then I can only manage, like, one or two pages, because the reading has always been that thing that puts me to sleep but the nonfiction books in the morning and just 10 pages, 10 pages, even just five pages. And if you're only like just two pages, you will get through a book, two pages at a time. You will get through a book. And often if you do it in those short little chunks and then go out and discuss parts of those things that you read from those two or five pages with somebody else, it sticks, it stays. But I want to tell you my experience with the Kobo. I, I received a Kobo as a gift then I, I put some books on it and I wanted the Kobo more because I didn't have to buy the books because if I want to buy a book, I want to buy the hard copy. But with Kobo, you can actually borrow from the library and put it on your Kobo. So you can borrow books to see if it's a book that you want to buy. But I love the Kobo when I go traveling because otherwise my suitcases are way too heavy. And when I was out in a park with my brand new Kobo, just like the first 
I think it was the third book I was reading on the Kobo and I'm really absorbed in it. I'm sitting on a park bench in London, England. And I actually do this to turn a page. <laughs> I looked around to see if anybody caught me doing it. <laughs> In Wandsworth Common, London, England, if anybody's watching this and happened to be walking through that park that day and saw this it's woman. probably on YouTube with a million views. An electronic bucket. <laughs> I might be somewhere on their YouTube channel. Do you saw this woman? She licked her finger to turn the pages in an e-reader. <laughs> so anyway, there's my little confession about how un, um, uh, unaccustomed I was to an e-reader. <laughs> Tap. And, Tap. And <laughs> I'm curious because you mentioned about the speed reading and it's something that I've, because I read so much, I've looked at it. I mean, I read fast enough anyway, normally, but I, there was a few different courses, the Jim Quick and there was another one, uh, Ron White. But I don't know, I, I like to read at my own pace and just kind of delve into my little thoughts and kind of digest what I'm doing. And I find that if you're kind of speed reading, you're not going there. You're reading the book, but you're not in the same thought process. Yeah. You know, I, I totally agree with you because I, I can do some of the, the facets and the ability of, of speed reading if I want to, but I quickly slide back down into my natural mode of reading because I want to absorb what's there. And also, it's a great lead in to the other thing that I wanted to share with your audience today is that when we're reading methodically, when we're reading to ponder, when we're reading to, to take those concepts in and enjoy them or make them our own, how we can take this scientific concept and apply it to something in our life, I think that slower reading style serves that best. But one of the things I do when I'm reading and reading fiction, I can speed read it, but I slow myself down because there are so many things that I find. Let's see if I have one of the books right here. I thought I might, but what happens is when I read a, a fiction book in that methodical, slow, enjoyable way, I end up putting these little flags in the book of possible trigger quotes that I use with my students. And so in this journal, I uh, have my writing retreat journal. And I, I name all my journals on the side also so that when they're, because each one has a different purpose. So when they're sitting there, I can read and say, oh, this is the one I want. And this is the one I want. Obviously, I know them by color too. But, but sometimes if I, you know, it's a new one or whatever, I want to see, oh, right. This is the one that I have with my collaborative partner where we're talking about all of our different ideas. So this one also has a table of contents in between 50 and 70 for the time being, possibly more. I have little quotes to offer people for if they want to go and write. So some of your listeners might now might want to take one of these quotes and <gasps> pause and go try writing to it. So this is one of my own quotes that I thought, oh, this could be very interesting. This might lead people to write something, especially the people that you're talking to about how you want to create change because the change starts in here, right? When you're not ready to take your own pill, no one else's will fix you. Nice. I like that. So that requires or, or invites people to have a really good look at how advice from this person, and by the way, unsolicited advice is criticism. So advice from this person, advice from that person, didn't work when you weren't ready to take and swallow your own pill of accountability, your own realization that you are complicit in every detail of your life. Granted, some things might have happened to you in childhood that you were absolutely powerless to deal with or to change. But as an adult, who's responsible then to take what happened and turn the corner into how it can be a good thing? Like my students one time asked me, how can I remember all of their stories? And how can I remember details? And how can I say, remember when you did that and that story and the, the mouse was in the bathroom and you and your wife ended up naked trying to chase the mouse through the house? And this is a retired minister telling the story, right? He could tell a really good story. Well, that kind of humor and that kind of authenticity and being honest really would work well if you just push yourself a little more to tell the truth here that I think we're not getting because readers will always know if you're holding back. So 
when we tell those stories with authenticity, when we become real, when we take our own advice, when we uh, become accountable for, for everything in our lives, that's where the real magic happens. That's where the real magic is. So here, I'll offer another one to your, to your listeners. And this is a really good one for people that if you're in a, in a bad spot or you've just had a tragedy happen in your life and you're, you're struggling with how to recover from it, it is physically impossible to feel emotional pain at the same time as gratitude. So just finding that one little thing that you can be grateful for, even if it's a clean glass in your cupboard when the rest of the dishes are dirty to have a glass of water to replace all those tears you've just lost. Just that one clean glass or one, the next breath, you know, that we're grateful for the next breath. Gratitude is, is magic too. Yeah, very nice. I like that. I love that. And uh, cause when I was in, um, I don't know, sure. Was it in Tallinn or Croatia? I know you were doing uh, like uh, workshops, uh, facilities yeah, yeah so you might tell people because some people want to do the workshops as well and are facilitating a workshop so you might give some of the tips and tricks that you've learned on the workshops all right well so look at this right again in the same journal here on pages 90 i have how to run a workshop so let's just maybe run through some of the the first ones so if you're actually running an in-person workshop after this current state of affairs comes to an end. Let's not mention what should not be mentioned because it will come to an end and we'll be in the new normal. Then you want to pick a, a beautiful location because that in itself is inspiring and comforting and takes people totally out of wherever they're at in their lives. Have some windows, some air flow, some light. Have the meals taken care of good people. If you want them to be able to do some internal work or a writing workshop, which is my zone of genius, then you'll want to be strict if someone whispers during a quiet time, because in order to get that collaborative energy of everybody working together and writing on their project, to get that energy happening, you want to create that zone of silence. So there might be a talking corner outside that's way away from the writing center so that if people really need to go and talk an idea through or have a one-on-one -on -one with you as the leader, and always have an assistant because you are in demand. When you are leading a workshop and you're doing like a weekend workshop, you're in demand the whole time. Always have an assistant, somebody that's there to help. If um, people need some of their music, then definitely invite them to have headphones because some people don't work well in silence. Some people work well with the, is it the, the binaural beats mm -hmm. that, that yeah. help increase creativity. So they work with that. Just remind them that their headphones need to be quiet enough that people can't hear them beside because I'm one of those people that can work in absolute silence and some people need it. I can work with, with music as long as it doesn't have words and as long as it's not uh, an instrumental for a song that I know the words to. So let's go back to kind of the beginning. So the first day you would invite people to share what their projects are going to be or what they've come to learn or or look at in depth in the workshop and then people depending on what kind of different workshop they want to do you will change that around for what your purpose is what your agenda is what your goal is to help people do at your workshop everything that i say here is going to be guided and geared towards people who are coming to create you want to be able to announce that there's going to be some uninterrupted focus time and there will be some free time where people can check in. For me, I'm offering guided prompts and then that people can share if they're working on this kind of project or this or this. And so when I have that check-in and that check-in is really important for the host, regardless what your agenda is, because in that check-in, you find a lot about what each person needs and then you can use your intuitive side for me, my empathic intuitive side kicks in and I go, that's the quote that person needs, or that's what that person needs, or that's the handout that I can give that person. They're struggling with dialogue. I have handouts galore and how to get your characters speaking and doing dialogue in an authentic way. Then the gorgeous setting I mentioned before, a solid two days of work. So you want them to arrive. If it's a weekend workshop, you want them to arrive on the one first day Solid two days where they don't have to think about packing or going and then leave on the fourth day. That's ideal. An intense level of focus is achieved when you have those quiet times. 
once a day, everyone in a circle, I would suggest even twice a day for say in the morning, if anything came up while they slept, because I'm offering Ambika Devi. She's an awesome meditation instructor. I'm having her do guided meditations for my creatives. So then they might want to share about there's this brand new idea I got last night. And with writing, if other people want to lead writing workshops, I suggest that you don't let your people talk about their idea too much, because if they talk about it too much, they will lose some of that energy, that drive to actually write it or put it down on their screen, and they will lose some of that. So don't talk about it too early. Then uh, definitely have comfy chairs or surfaces for people to write on. Some people can write on their lap. Some people need a table or a surface. So you want to pick a retreat center that has little desks in, in areas in the rooms because some people might go away to the room to write instead of being in that zone where they might hear pens scratching. Because I once had a student that actually said that I cannot sit beside that person because her pen scratches too loud. So you want to be able to have some space for people to spread out if little sounds like that can, you know, interfere with people. What my sister says, she, Virginia Lee Hay, she's a mind, body, emotional healer coach, does transformation through dialogue. And what she says about the people that can't take some of those little noises is that they have their own noises going on in their head too, they're, they're too loud. They have to deal with some of their own stuff <laughs> before they, and then, you know, a lot of that stuff can wash off. The other ideas I have here is uh, to have some definite schedules for people that you really try to stick to because there are people that just really need to know what happens next. And then also if they know that their writing time is this long, they won't squander it because they know once they get a sense that you keep on schedule within five minutes, you know, there's a little bit of a leeway, but once they know you keep on schedule, they, that will also provide extra motivation for them to use the time that you've given them. Then, to check in at each time. What do you want to accomplish in the next setting? Do you feel, how do you feel about what you've accomplished now? So the first hour of any retreat is really important to plan. Have people put their phones in airplane mode or at least on silent. Limit the time on each task so that they can get things done. Send them off to their blocks where they either choose to stay in the circle or go to their room to write at their desk or, or, you know, choose a spot. This one retreat center that I've chosen for a retreat I'm doing in July outside of Toronto is beautiful. Heather Kerr has redone an 1800s farmhouse, brand new, amazing, with an art gallery across the driveway where people are surrounded by art. And you can sit at this big boardroom table sharing the ideas to let them write. Then they can leave and find spots on the acreage down by the water, on some pretty benches and sitting in the shade or out in the sun if people like sun or in the farmhouse themselves in the beautiful room she has there. So that's, again, that beautiful location is important. Planning the accountability so people can check in to say how it went. Then the casual lunches where there also might be some yoga breaks in the morning before food. Yoga is always important before food. Then right back to the writing in the afternoon. So there are some great ideas about that. And once I type that up, if people want some of those ideas, I'm happy to share those too. Because I believe that there's enough for everyone. It, 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 you know, the more people out there doing what I do to help people find their words and their voice, the better it is. There's enough for everyone and there's people that need you. There's people that need me, what I have to offer. We're all unique and we have amazing gifts to offer each and every one of us. Exactly. And I'm just curious because um, regarding the typing, because I know some people, they type everything. Others, they use the pen and paper and then later convert it. I know I, I, I've heard before, and I write, I constantly write a lot and like with the neurons when you're writing is there a different thought process what, what's your thought on that there is there definitely is it's a very good question so when we did, did you know first of all if you take notes at a session by hand you're going to remember 80 percent more we only remember 20 percent when we take notes on a screen or a keyboard oh. So writing by hand, there is something that happens from the brain, down the arm if you're right-handed, down the left arm if you're left-handed. There's something that happens that connects you viscerally to what you're writing about. So I highly suggest to write things by hand and then to transcribe it. And for transcribing that's difficult for people, 
I have one person that comes to a group that I, I lead, I volunteer to lead at a local cafe in an area of, of Edmonton that's a little bit disenfranchised. It's called The Hood, but anybody can come and sit and write. And I have one person that can tell stories. Oh man, he can tell stories. He can tell stories about how him and some buddies of his found this pool hiking in Amazon that was full of these naked women. <laughs> He tells these stories and he's over 70 and he's just got this glint in his eye when he talks. And he says, but I hate writing and I hate the typing. Well, get a dictation device or find a dictation app that works for you because then it's so easy. I do that. I, I love typing. I'm pretty good. I'm about 80 words a minute with some mistakes when I really get going. But I still write by hand every day in the morning. So yes, whether you're teasing the 26 gods of the keyboard or whether you're writing by hand, I suggest that you find a way for those first ideas or to teach yourself how to write in the morning by hand. Now, some people are nighttime creatives and that's great. Find that time of day and create that ritual for yourself where you can write. One of my absolute favorite books on writing was Copyright 1937 by Dorothea Brand, Becoming a Writer. She believed that anyone can become a writer. And what's incredible about what she teaches is that obviously it was way before we had keyboards uh, that, you know, were unless they were a typewriter, which were really quite different because you had to use a lot of force and you had to slow down with the way that they created them. Otherwise the keys would jam. But she said, sit there with your pen and your paper. And I think she must've borrowed something. Was it Edison that had the steel marble ball in his hand and he would, he would sit with that in his lap mm -hmm. over a cookie tray or something. And then when he, he would like kind of get himself into a trance and when it dropped, he would then have his notepad ready, his pen in his hand and his notepad and he would write right away those first glimmers. And that's why, I'm a morning writer. Now, some people can get themselves into that zone of genius at nighttime. That's great. All the power to you. At night, I can revise. In the morning, I create. Find your rhythm, what works for you. But Dorothea Brand talked about get yourself into that trance, whether it's washing floors, whether it's washing dishes. And for me, washing dishes is a meditation. I know I'm a strange one. I like washing dishes. But to get yourself in that trance for a rocking chair or just to sit and do some meditation or listen to some binaural beats with the notebook in your hand. And don't let yourself get up or leave there until you've written five minutes. Now the brain will get tired if you're sitting, oh, I've got to cook dinner. 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 Your brain will get tired of that and you will write something. And then what Dorothea Brand suggests that I've had my students do, and they've reported to me it really works, is when you write something, avoid the temptation of reading it right away. Don't edit, never edit. Put the editor somewhere else while you're writing. Trust that first draft, let it all come out, let it flow in the page, doesn't matter how it comes out. Put it away for five days, don't read it until five days, a minimum of five days. And you will be surprised how different it is when you come back to it and go, oh, I wrote that. Ah, oh, there's a pretty good idea there. <laughs> and the next thing I wanna to suggest to beginning or early writers, if you haven't had some of those moments of, oh, I can write, find yourself a friendly reader. And this is how you train a friendly reader. You have the friendly reader give feedback only one or two ways. So the first way is to say, I want to know more about the barn or that or that or that. I want to know more about and then fill in the blank. There's no buts, no ands, no this, no that. You just say, I want to know more about that. The other way that a friendly reader can give feedback is to repeat a phrase to them word for word, if you can remember it, and say, when you wrote about the old man and the falling down barn to talk about the son, but never mentioned that he died at war, oh. So you mention something back to them directly what they've written, and then the writer knows, oh, that really worked. Or the writer knows, oh, they're right, I forgot to write this other part where they want to know more about that. So then it gives feedback in such a, a non-judgmental, non-critical way that it keeps the, the writer spirit alive. Because you know, the wrong editor, the wrong comment 
you know, like a, a, the writer editor relationship is like a marriage. It has to work really well. And so the wrong comment, the wrong editor, the, the, the criticism at the wrong time can damage the person's desire to write, can damage or interfere with their voice, or just absolutely kill it altogether. And that's a tragedy. Oh, yeah. Um, um, like uh, when I done mine, I printed it off. I'd done 10 copies to get it into hands and I got uh, asked the person could they check it for me. And like they said, I stopped there after one chat, but there were so many errors and, you know, grammar and everything. And what's strange is I have proofread a load of books for people and I spot loads. Of, but because I was reading it in my head, my own book, I had so many errors. I couldn't believe it. It was, oh. I even all professional books, books that come out now, I will always spot something, a typo error or something that comes up. But my own, it was like there was hundreds of them. And oh. so I have learned to actually speak out loud when I'm actually reading. Because That's what I was going to suggest to you or any of your listeners too, is that you read it out loud and you hear things that you might not catch with your own writing. The other thing is to get and have one of those friendly readers in the room or even on the other end of the phone. I say I have an article that's due for the paper that I write for here and uh, I need to read it aloud now and I can catch some of the things when I read it aloud but sometimes I call my sister. She can be doing dishes clanging away in the background and I can read to her and I will hear things that I did not hear when I was reading it aloud to myself. Just having another person in the room reading aloud, you hear things. Mm -hmm. And then another thing to do when you're proofing your own work is to read it backwards, not word for word, but sentence to sentence, read it backwards. Because then some missing transu transitions might become glaringly obvious if, when, when you're doing it that. Also read it in chunks. Read it to a dictation device, not a dictation, read it to a recording device so then you can listen to it back. And then you're listening to it. And then the other thing is that, okay, my manuscript is written. I've edited it, I've proofread it, I've had somebody else proofread it. It's going to the printer tomorrow. I think I better look at it one more time. So, that is also then getting you to look at it in a brand new way, in a way that changes your brain and you all of a sudden become the audience and you will catch the mistakes that you catch when you're reading professionally published books. Mm. Very good. Excellent. And uh, like, do you uh, think it's better to do print on demand or what's the best uh, because I've heard of different uh, ways of doing it. Is the print on demand the best option for people? It, it, it can be because then that keeps your front cost and down, front end cost down. There's also offshore printing. There is, uh, with, the, with the first book, before you go to print, this is another trick that you can do too, is you get people to buy your book ahead of time. Get them to commit ahead of time and say, the book's coming out, here's a sample, putting you on the advanced sale list. The advanced sale list is this price. And when it actually comes out, it will be this price. So that you get people to commit ahead of time. And then you can go ahead and get a larger amount of books done ahead of time without being out of pocket. The other thing is that if you're writing a book that, let's say you're interviewing those 10 experts, they might actually pay you to put an ad in the back. And how you do this is as a template that I offer my, my authors and then I work with them to word it just right to catch the attention of their potential people. Is that you write a letter saying that your target clients are my readers, my audience. And my publisher has suggested I put an extra chapter in the back of my book with resources are you interested in being a resource in there and benefiting from all of the marketing that I'll be doing and then let them know. And so I tailor make those letters then with my authors for their audience, for their potential people that might be sponsors, sponsors putting an ad in their book. Nice. The other thing, when you do the how to book and you're your own expert all the way through, you can contact people again, whose market intersects with yours, but it's not a competitive market, but that they do something for your ideal market and their ideal market they intersect 
Excellent. Well, you've given some fantastic uh, bits of advice and you're going to give different uh, things as well that I can put in the description where they can find it. Uh, what about your own speaking? Because you've obviously uh, spoke at the Eric Edmeads. Um, did, prior to that, were you actually speaking and how you were? What was your... I have been an MC for years for various functions. One of my favorite was the African the African American Fashion Week, and I got to wear African American fashions. <laughs> it's white skin <laughs> or pink skin. It's not white. Um, so that that was a, a great deal of fun getting to flirt with some of the the people, the photographers. There's a huge name photographer here in Edmonton that I actually sat in his lap with the microphone and <laughs> was getting him to speak and stuff. It was a lot of fun. So I've been MC for years for various events, and then. I have done some speaking before, spoke at a Rotary Club, spoke at some um, weekend uh, retreats. But then after Eric Edmead, I've, I've done a little bit more speaking, but I have some higher goals now, some big goals. And one of the big things I'm super passionate about is how we can be victors instead of, instead of the word that I'd like to eradicate and really it's the opposite of accountability when we think that that we have a reason to blame someone we are losing our creative power so as soon as we take responsibility for every detail in our lives which i hinted at earlier there's amazing things that can happen and uh, the world can open up to us and how powerful and creative we can be in fact it's bruce lipton that says we totally rob ourselves of our creative power and our creative abilities when we stay in the victim place, the word that I want to see gone, because there's, there's no benefit to staying in a victim place. And really it's, it's a game that uh, we become addicted to. It creates some of the same chemicals in the drug, the same chemical highs that, that hallucinogenic substances do, that victim, persecutor, rescue game, that's a triangle. And so I'm a victim. That means you over there are my persecutor and you're nasty, and I need a rescuer here. And so the rescuer gets a high out of being a rescuer. The persecutor gets parts of their brain chemistry up, and I get my brain chemistry up before me. But when we step out of that game and refuse to be a victim, the persecutor has to change or find somebody else. And that's why I want to get rid of the word, because if we get rid of the word, if we get rid of that feeling, if we get rid of that state, in a large proportion of the population, can we end persecution? Yes, exactly. I think we can. I, I believe so too. I, I believe like if you want to see change, be the change. And there's just, there's plenty of people that will get on. You know, and it, I, I think it comes down to words that I'll have more of an impact with a book, with my words, which later obviously can go into the speaking side, but by actually the way I word something, I can make that switch in somebody's head to go from, you know, where they start thinking positive, they can make the change, or if they're part of the problem, that they stop doing what they're doing just by the words that are written there. Yes, absolutely. This was so much fun talking with you, Roy. Like I said, I could talk about food and writing all day long. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been, it's been fantastic. So how, how can people get in contact with you? My name is my website without the middle and initial L. It's rustylehay.ca. Okay, perfect. And, what and then I'm on Instagram with Rusty Lee Hay and on Twitter with Rusty Lee Hay. On Facebook, it's Rusty Lee, my part of my middle name, Lee, L E E. So I'm out there with my name, and it's, it's a pretty uncommon name, so I have an advantage there. Exactly. Well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll put uh, in the description and where they can get you and then we'll you know where they can get the what you've promised to, to give them whether it's a download you send an email or whatever we'll, we'll figure sure. it out Perfect. okay thank you very much really appreciate it it was excellent i'm even talking about the workshop and everything because I, I i discuss workshops with a lot of people and you have done it in a way that i love because you know i've never got the right answer and i i love the way that you actually describe how a workshop should be done and the way to be watching out for things so i really appreciate Wait. it all right. Well, so nice, have, uh, so nice being here with you. You're a great, great person to hang out with. I'll do it anytime. I'll tell other people they've got to hang out with you. And uh, let me know how I can help you. Thank you very much. All right.